So your game console's broken, which has got you thinking, you know, this makes it hard to play video games. Well, that's no good. I mean, what is life without video games? Just trust me, you don't want to know. When it comes to a broken game console, you've got yourself a couple different options. You can fix it, or you can break it even worse. Well, no harm there. I mean, broken is broke, right? Wrong. Yeah, when trying to fix a console yourself, you run the risk of breaking it beyond repair, or perhaps just making it a lot more complicated and or expensive to repair. I mean, talk about a nice little Saturday. The sun is shining, the air is crisp, the birds are chirping, and you're inside spending hours jacking up your console. All right, time well spent. It's a classic conundrum. Do you risk investing the time it takes to try to fix something without knowing for sure if you can fix it? Or do you just cut your losses and get rid of it? Well, the problem with getting rid of it is that it's wasteful. And if we're talking about preservation, yeah, that's certainly a factor to consider with these older consoles. I mean, if you toss out a bad apple, the world will find a way to carry on. But throw out something like a Super Nintendo and a little piece of every retro gamer out there dies inside. Ooh, did anyone else feel that one? Somebody must have just thrown out a Neo Geo. Of course, you could always just have, wait, hold on, somebody just threw out a bunch of Super Nintendo boxes. So as I was saying, you could always have somebody else fix your console for you, or have somebody else fix your console for them by selling it to them. Yep, that's right. You can sell your broken console to somebody else. Seems like kind of a win-win, right? The problem of fixing it is no longer yours, and you get paid some money for it. Never has making your problem somebody else's problem been so easy. But who would buy a broken console, you might be thinking? Well, you would. Yep, it's something that all of us have likely at least considered at one point or another. I mean, the mantra of almost every retro gamer is save that money. And what better way to save money than to buy stuff broken and fix it yourself. On paper, this idea always sounds great at the time of purchase. You save a bunch of money, you've got yourself a fun little project, and just think of how satisfying it is going to be to fix something yourself. You'll likely learn a little something along the way. It's just going to be an all-around great experience. Unless it's not. And from what I've heard, people get burned all the time doing this. What you gotta think about about is that there's a chance whoever sold it to you could have already tried to fix it to no avail. And sure, maybe they couldn't fix it because they're an idiot, but so are we. I say that with love. In reality, very few of us are experts at fixing this stuff. Yeah, whoever sold you that broken console could have been feeling sweet, sweet relief when they offloaded it to you. Check out what I found inside of a broken console I bought. Of course, there are exceptions to this. Maybe they are selling it because they never tried fixing it and wouldn't have even known where to start. And maybe you are able to fix whatever issue a console is having. Even those of us who may feel like we don't know a lot about fixing consoles are still capable of fixing some of the issues that consoles are prone to have, with certain fixes being a lot more simple than others. When it comes to fixing your own consoles, the best way to gauge if you should fix it yourself is to look up how to fix it first, so that you can see how it's done, preferably in video form, and then ask yourself, could I do what I just saw? But here's the key while being honest about it. I mean, I'd love to bake myself a chocolate raspberry souffle, but I always have to face reality when I realize my skills aren't quite there yet. This is where things get interesting, because on one hand, you have people whose enthusiasm makes them overestimate their abilities, but then on the other hand, you have people whose concern for the video games they love so much 
causes them to be overprotective. I mean, some people won't even play their games because they're worried being gently inserted into the consoles will damage them. If only everyone was that cautious. One of the huge sticking points that I notice a lot of people running into is soldering. I used to think there was no way I'd ever be capable of doing such a thing, but I feel like it looks a lot more intimidating than it actually is. Naturally, there are people who will tell you it's easy, which is helpful advice? Yeah, not really. I mean, if you're trying to build up somebody's confidence, then sure, but a lot of times when people say something is easy, what they really mean is, it's easy for me. Well, great for you. Things usually are easy for the people who know how to do them. Me saying the Turbo Tunnel in Battletoads is easy, because I've played through it a million times, isn't making it any easier for somebody who struggles with it. But even before you decide whether or not you're capable of fixing what might be wrong with the console, you must first determine what exactly it is that's wrong with it to begin with. And this can often be the most difficult thing to determine, the diagnosis. What makes it tricky is that certain issues can be caused by a wide variety of different things. I mean, just opening up a console, there's no end to the amount of parts that might have gone bad, whether they look like they've gone bad or not. Additionally, sometimes the best way to figure out what's wrong is by trying out different solutions, the good old guess and check method. Although, ideally, it's more of an educated guess and check. In any case, my advice would be that you should have a pretty good idea of what the issue is before you decide to try to fix it, or at the very least, the potential fixes you plan on trying come with a low risk of damaging the console further. Whoa, whoa, easy there, buddy. Where did you get that advice from? Now, while the sheer amount of potential problems a console could be having might seem overwhelming and discouraging, the good news is that from my experience, some of the most common issues that consoles have also tend to be the easiest to both diagnose and fix, of which I'd like to go over a handful of them. One of the easiest problems to diagnose is a console not powering on. You try to turn it on and nothing happens. Now, immediately a lot of people will question whether or not the power cable or power brick has gone bad, but in my experience, that is extremely unlikely. Sure, it could happen, but it's not very common. If your console isn't powering on, it's likely an issue with the console itself. As far as fixing it goes, depending on the console, there's a chance it could be an easy, quick, and inexpensive repair. For some examples, let's take one cartridge-based console, the Super Nintendo, and one CD-based console, the PlayStation 1. For the Super Nintendo, all you likely have to do is just replace this little power fuse. They have a tendency to go bad. Of course, this does require soldering, though, the old bugaboo for some of you. That being said, not all soldering jobs are the same level of difficulty, and when it comes to soldering jobs, this has got to be one of the easiest ones there is. The main thing you can do to make soldering easier is make sure you have a nice, pointy tip on the end of your soldering iron. That way you can be a lot more precise and not accidentally make contact with the wrong thing, like your finger. And since we're talking about soldering, I'll give my own personal quick little explanation of how to do it and how it works. You plug in the soldering iron into an outlet, you wait a little while as it heats up, and then you apply the tip of it to the contact you wish to solder. Now, my power fuse is just fine, so my iron is unplugged and I'm not going to actually solder it, but essentially, each solder point is a bit of metal that, when heated up, turns into a liquid that you can insert or remove something from, in this case, a power fuse. Once you remove heat from the solder point, it will fairly quickly return back to a solid and hold whatever it was that you connected to it in place. If this was taught in school, it's something that I promise everyone would know how to do. 
Kind of a missed opportunity. When's the last time memorizing the periodic table fixed your Super Nintendo? I rest my case. But for any console that has a power fuse, with the Super Nintendo being just one of them, a lot of times that's all you gotta do to get your console powering on again. Just find where the fuse is, buy a replacement fuse online, remove the old one, and replace it with the new one. You'll definitely want to look up a video for your specific console before doing so, but it can be as simple as that. If a console has an internal power supply like the PlayStation 1 does, then the fix is even more simple, in theory at least. It all depends on how easily you can find a replacement power supply. If you find a replacement, and always, always make sure that it is compatible with your console, it's as simple as could be. You just unplug the old one and plug the new one back in. Sometimes it's hard to find a replacement power supply though, either aftermarket or pulled from a different console. It's not like you can just borrow your friend's console and swipe the power supply out of it. You can't, they're your friend, remember? Next up, let's talk about issues with reading games. For disc-based consoles, this can be a fairly straightforward fix, and there's a few different options you have. The easiest thing you can try first is to simply clean off the laser lens. Just a good old Q-tip with a tiny dab of isopropyl alcohol ought to do the trick. What can't a Q-tip dipped in isopropyl alcohol do? Help me bake that souffle, I guess. Be sure to dry it off before you power it back on, and then see if it improves the performance at all. I'll be honest, your laser lens is probably not going to be dirty enough in the first place for this to make much of an improvement. It's not like you're wiping your butt with your consoles or something, but it can happen and it's such an easy fix to try. The other thing you can try is to adjust the laser's potentiometer, generally located underneath the laser assembly. In practice, a lot of people will just randomly crank this thing up until it gets their console to work, although technically you should be using the proper equipment to measure the adjustments you're making. But as always, whenever people don't have to do something, they often won't. In any case, this is generally seen as a temporary fix more than anything. The best way to fix a laser is to replace it, and lucky you, replacement lasers are generally pretty easy to find, and also generally pretty easy to actually replace. You just unplug a connector and ribbon from the old one, and then plug the connector and ribbon from the new one into those same slots. Be wary of cheap third-party units though. As with anything, you'll benefit from looking up reviews from people who have used the same product with successful results to report back. Now, thus far I've been showing a lot of consoles opened up, which raises a good point you should always be able to open up your consoles. In some cases, just a typical Phillips head screwdriver will do the job. But in other cases, a special security bit is required. These companies really didn't want kids opening up their consoles back in the day. But what if the kids in your home have access to these special security bits? Well, then you'll have to resort to other methods. In any case, you'll want to make sure that you yourself have all the special security bits to open up your consoles. Luckily, there is some overlap with these and you'll likely just need a few different things. These two are the bread and butter of most retro gamers tools as they open up both consoles and games, most notably for the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis. You may also want a tri-wing screwdriver, often required for the screws on many Nintendo products, even controllers. Being able to get inside your gaming stuff is essential because you can't diagnose or fix any problems otherwise. And remember, being able to properly diagnose the problem is often the most difficult thing to figure out. Speaking of which, so let's say you're trying to figure out why your console is broken, but can't do it. Hey, it happens. So what do you do? Ask other people to see if they can figure it out. And the best way to do this, ask door to door in your neighborhood, am I right? 
or you can go to your favorite forum or place online to chat and explain the issue you're having. Then refresh the page like a maniac all day until finally some responses come back. And what do you get? Likely a bunch of people who aren't sure what the problem is, but all have different guesses. Bummer. It would have been more reassuring if everybody was in more agreement over what the problem is. In any case, because people are mostly guessing what the problem could be, you're likely going to need to look into any suggestion further before you try it. Make sure it's safe, and if you can, try to look up a video of somebody successfully performing the repair. That way, you can be more confident about trying it yourself. When it comes to games, however, it's a lot easier to fix them because there's far less things that may have gone wrong with the game, especially for a game disc. If it's not working, it basically comes down to resurfacing the disc seeing if that works, and that's that. Essentially, there's a layer of plastic that protects the layer of the disc that contains the actual game data. If that protective layer gets too damaged, aka scratched up, then it will no longer be able to read the data layer properly. So, by smoothing out the protective layer, it will read the data layer better. However, if you have scratches that are deep enough they've reached the data layer, you're probably screwed. A disk resurfacer can't save this one. It's generally a better idea to have it done by a professional machine, likely at a shop of some kind, but in a pinch, you can always just use one of these janky hand-operated doohickeys. The thing is that it typically will get a disc working. I tell you, cranking one of these bad boys will make you feel like a real handyman. But the downside is that it makes the disc look like garbage with this wacky radial pattern. But still, I suppose you could argue, how often are you going to be looking at the bottom of a disc? I mean... I know folks love to stare at their games, but at the bottom of discs, too? Eh, just knowing it's there lurking underneath the surface might be enough to bother people. Your call. Cartridges are generally pretty easy to get working as well. Sure, it's possible they can go dead, but typically all you gotta do is clean the contacts with the good old Q-tip and isopropyl alcohol method. Then try it a bunch of times until the cartridge works. I will say, and I have no proof of this, although I have heard other people say they experienced this too, but I feel like sometimes cartridges need a bit of warming up if you haven't played them for a really long time. No, not that kind of warming up. Or, well, actually, I don't see any harm in that. Regardless, the point is that a cartridge may come to life after a bunch of tries, even if it doesn't fire up on the very first try. Now, if you still can't get your game to work, there is one more suggestion that I can offer. Once upon a time, my Pokemon Red cartridge wouldn't work. Being a childhood favorite of mine, having it not work simply would not do. So, after cleaning the cartridge and determining that isopropyl alcohol wasn't going to be bringing it back to life, I read that you can sometimes get a game working again by heating up the solder points on the board, which would of course then cool down immediately after, as solder does. From my understanding, this gets the juices flowing through the board again, and lucky me, this fixed my Pokemon game. But what about save batteries? After all, that's going to be the most likely repair you'll need to perform on your old cartridges. It's cheap to buy replacement batteries, and it's one of the easiest soldering jobs you could practice. So I definitely recommend learning how to do it. Losing my Chrono Trigger save file halfway through the game is what motivated me to learn how to do it, years and years ago. Having a fresh battery before you start a longer game is very comforting. All right, so to answer the question, should you fix your own consoles? I think the answer is that you should at least do your due diligence to see if you're capable of fixing them or can find the means to learn how to fix them. Having a friend who's really good at fixing consoles is probably the best case scenario. That way they could fix your console and fix you, at least in terms of what you know. Spreading the knowledge of how to fix these
these consoles. Plus, believe me, when you do fix one of your game consoles, it makes your system seem even better. Never before has Mario jumped like that. Never before have the colors popped out of the screen the way they do. You'll have a whole new appreciation for your console. Now, I understand that most of us cannot and will not become experts in fixing these consoles, and you definitely don't want to break things further if you're not confident, but I think we owe it to ourselves as well as the retro gaming community as a whole to try to educate ourselves the best we can, and try to put ourselves in a good position to be able to preserve all of this wonderful hardware. I tell you what, at the very least, we should try to make sure every broken console finds its way into the hands of somebody capable of fixing it, whether that's your own hands or not. Fair enough? I should also mention that good preventative care can go a long ways too. That's right, doing what we can to have them not break in the first place. Take good care of your games and consoles. Don't be too rough with them. Keep them clean. Read them a bedtime story. We're building lasting memories with our game consoles here, folks. But with that, I'd like to ask this video's question, which is, what is a time you fixed one of your game consoles? Would love to hear those answers, and maybe we could even learn something by reading all the different answers. So with that, leave your response down below, and I will see ya in the next video. He's the Red Cooper, yeah. And he's talking, talking about video games.